Antarctic ice sheet flow. Hi, um, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, I'm Fiona. I'm a postdoc at Le Mans at Columbia. Um, and today I'll be talking about, uh, I've shortened my title a little bit, but the influence of subglacial hydrothermal convection on waste evolution, um, which was work done in collaboration with my co-authors, uh, Johnny Kingslake, Jackie Osterman, and Roger Buck. Um, and so we just saw an excellent overview of um, the importance and uncertainties associated with estimating geothermal heat flux beneath waste. Um, and uh, to summarize, so beneath, um, within like the, this West Antarctic rift system, um, we think the heat flow might be, uh, is elevated and also sp uh, spatially variable. And it consists an important boundary condition for ice flow and ice models. Um, and so as we have seen throughout this session, there's this open question of whether the heat flux that's imparted at the, um, that comes from inferences of temperature at mantle and crustal depths, whether this background heat flow corresponds to that which is felt by the base of the ice sheet. And so at the same time, while um, there are still a lot of uncertainties associated with understanding the lithology of um, the bedrock beneath uh, West Antarctica, um, we have some confidence that uh, sedimentary basins may be present, uh, especially, or pr we ha um, there's a likelihood that sedimentary basins may be present within the interior of the West Antarctic ice sheet. So um, in, we've seen this figure this morning, but um, within the West Antarctic interior, um, using a, a, incorporating multiple data sets, um, lead all infer a likelihood of like 50 to 60 percent um, scattered throughout. And so this raises the question of whether there may be an overlap between regions of high heat flux and the locations of sedimentary basins beneath waste um, and elsewhere on Earth that are characterized by high heat flow and abundant groundwater. Um, those locations may be prone to hydrothermal activity, so most notably um, on the seafloor, we see like hydrothermal vents near like volcanic features. So that is, for example, um, in the Bransfield Basin is a, um, in this image. Uh, and this raises a possibility for subglacial hydrothermal convection beneath the West Antarctic ice sheet. Um, and then if, if we pose this question of whether or not we may get subglacial hydrothermal convection beneath waste, then we might ask, uh, first, under what conditions and how vigorous would this convection be? Like, what is the influence of lithology and what is the influence of background heat flow? And then we might also ask what would be the influence of this convection on ice flow and glacial cycles? And to answer this first one, I'll use in this talk some scaling arguments, and then for the second one, I'll show some numerical modeling. So starting with the scaling arguments, um, so the heating of a porous layer from beneath and the onset of convection is uh, well studied both experimentally and uh, theoretically. And it can be characterized by a Rayleigh number, which is the time scale of diffusion to, of heat to the time scale of um, the advection of heat by porous flow. And so um, that will scale with the geothermal heat flux that is imparted at the base of our plate um, the permeability of the medium and the vertical length scale squared, so H here. And in this cartoon of these different um, isochrons in, in plates of increasing Rayleigh number, we see that at low Rayleigh number, um, the, we approach a linear conductive temperature profile. And then as we're increasing the Rayleigh number, we develop um, more vigorous convection and then these uh, thermal boundary layers at the top and, and bottom, implying that the gradient of temperature at the top and therefore the heat flux at the top that the ice sheet would feel, presumably, will be higher under greater Rayleigh number. And so if we, we can use this scaling and plug in uh, parameters that we think are appropriate for sedimentary basins beneath waste, 
And so this is what, what, what we get. So in, in this parameter space of layer depth, which would correspond to the sedimentary basin depth in a layer which is of constant permeability, versus the background heat flux, so that which is imparted by the crust or mantle. And then for two different permeabilities, um, so these would correspond to sands, um, but fall within a much wider range of, of potential permeabilities over several orders of magnitude. Um, and then, so then the color scheme shows how much this background heat flux would be enhanced. So in white, for a value, this would be a value of, of one, and so this would not be enhanced. Um, and that's the conductive regime under shallow layers and low background heat fluxes. And then in, in deeper red, we're seeing that this heat flux that enhancement um, under high heat flow and um, deep layers, uh, we would predict you know, really quite drastic enhancement in uh, geothermal heat flux to the tune of like 100 fold in these really um, you know, extreme conditions in the lower right. And so in the rest of this talk, I'll focus on two end member models. So one of which would be um, at the limit of, so this black line is the onset of convection, the critical Rayleigh number. And so I'm gonna look at a model which is in this conductive regime near this limit, and then a model which has a higher Rayleigh number and higher heat flow and within this convective regime. Okay, so we've answered this first question where um, it seems that if we have elevated heat flow, high permeability, and deep basins, it would be plausible to have um, hydrothermal convection in waste sedimentary basins. Um, and so now on to the second one, which would be um, under elevated, under hydrothermal convection, what, how would we influence um, ice flow? And to answer this, I'm gonna um, use two coupled models. So the first model is a 1D flow line model of an ice sheet um, coupled with, uh, that includes a till with variable water content. And then this second model is um, a two-dimensional porous Darcyan flow um, that is forced by some background geothermal heat flux. Uh, focusing first on the second model, so we're solving for the evolution of temperature and the evolution of, of pressure, which drives flow. Um, and again, heated at the bottom, impermeable at the bottom, and in fixed temperature at the top. Um, and importantly, uh, it will, the groundwater will feel pressure loading from the ice sheet, and this will also drive flow. Uh, so I'll now show some model results. So using this low background heat flow that was in the conductive regime, um, I'm showing an imposed ice thickness on the top, so I've, um, uh, and then I'm, on the bottom, I'll be showing the temperature evolution, and then the arrows show the evolution of the flow field. And in the middle plot, I'm showing the heat flux that you would feel at the top of the um, groundwater layer. And so you see that as the ice goes back and forth, you're pushing flow in and out, um, and you're influencing the heat flow at the top, which, um, so you're depressing the heat flow near the interior and increasing it at the ice margin. And so this seems to be pretty systematic over multiple glacial cycles. Moving forward to a model in which we have high background heat flux, so going from 50 milliwatts per meter squared to 100 milliwatts per meter squared. So under, this would be under this convective regime. Um, so you can see the temperatures are, are greater at, at the same depths. Um, so we see that we are starting to develop these hydrothermal convection cells. And in areas of upwelling, we're having this localized um, heat flow anomaly um, that is quite high, right? So the lengths, this bar, this scale has changed and we're almost at one watt per meter squared. And so we're seeing these variations in any heat flow and now we might ask how is that gonna influence the ice sheet advance and retreat? Um, so which brings us to the second part of the model, which is the um, 1D flow line. So we're solving for the thickness of the ice sheet and the water content. Um, and we're using the model similar to that of Robo et al. 2014, in which if there's more water, the till is weaker and the ice flows more readily. And then the water content depends on the heat balance, which uh, is sensitive to the heat flux from the bottom layer. And finally, there's a climate forcing that 
um, varies over uh, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, sorry, that has a 100,000 year periodicity that is forcing the ice back and forth also. Um, and so, uh, so this is what the, um, the low heat flow model looks like. So again, we have ice thickness along the top heat flux at the surface of the model, of the groundwater model, water content um, in the till, and an ice velocity on the bottom. Um, and here is the, the temperature evolution. Um, so this is a slightly different model because the length scale is, is 10 times larger than it was previously, so there's a, um, a lot of vertical exaggeration, which is why this might look different. Um, and so we see the Dashed, so the solid line is our main model result, but then I also ran um, this dashed line, which would be uh, the same thing, but in the absence of a forcing from temperature. Um, and um, so we see um, that more or less the dashed line and the solid line are uh, uh, together. So there's a, kind of a very small influence, although the depression of heat flow means that you're generating slightly less meltwater in the coupled model um, and lower velocity. Uh, moving forward to the, um, the high heat flow model, we see, um, the again, all these different hydrothermal convection cells, which is raising the, the heat flow and leading to all these little anomalies in heat flux um, along the profile, increasing the water content and leading to greater uh, ice flow. And if you compare the dashed line and the solid line, you see that the um, dashed line, or sorry, the solid line retreats slightly more rapidly than the dashed line. Um, so the ice sheet model that has this forcing that uh, is sensitive to the evolution in, in heat flow um, retreats more rapidly during a deglaciation. Um, and so in summary, um, we found that it is plausible for subglacial hydrothermal convection to occur um, underneath waste, and that if we include this in, um, in a simple model for the evolution of, of um, an ice sheet, we find that the, including this forcing can um, accelerate or decelerate glacial advance and retreat depending on the vigor of convection or the Rayleigh number. And so this is like a very small part of the parameter space, and I'm um, looking forward to further exploring um, this like additional like, complexity in linking uh, the lithosphere and background heat flow, flow to that which is felt by the base of the ice sheet. Uh, thanks, and happy to have any questions. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, we don't have time for questions. <laughs> Uh, next up is Catherine Ritz. Uh, 